to get really far ahead of the game. There's another story in here called the last science fiction story. And the premise is simply that the future can't happen because it's already passed. And therefore you can't write stories about the future because the future is over. Therefore, science fiction, which is by definition how a left-brain society dreams in a right-brain way of its own future, is increasingly impossible. And that is also why science fiction has so radically shifted. I'm not alone in saying this. Bruce Sterling said to me about 10 years ago at a computer freedom and privacy, he said, five years maybe. Same kind of thought I was having. Five years maybe is as far as we can go. But when Jules Verne wrote From the Earth to the Moon in the 1860s, we had 100 years to go before it was realized. When Neuromancer was written in the early 80s, we had about 20 years before people began using the word cyberspace to mean their normative everyday life. Now we don't have that lag time at all. Things are happening faster and faster. And so I noticed another thing happened, called my attention biohacking, MIT appointed a president a few years ago, Susan Hockfield, whose background was biology. When M These are the markers you use. When MIT chooses a president whose background is biology, it says something to you about the future of engineering. And again, as a sign that I wasn't that far ahead, I read an interview with Bill Gates about how he did what he did, and he talked about what he really was above all, was open to possibilities, and the possibility at the time in front of him was the computer. Today, he said, I would not go into computing. I would go into biology. So when you have a convergence of points of view of smart people saying this, Susan Hockfield said about five or six years ago, the challenge of archiving and manipulating large data sets, a common problem in physical science and engineering, is now endemic to modern society. The tools that engineers and physicists develop for their work are finding new life in the biology lab. The Human Genome Project draws on math and computational science every bit as much as powerful new gene sequencing technologies. Therefore, she said in recent years, the two revolutions in the life sciences, molecular biology and genomics, have triggered a third revolution. Initially, the connection between life scientists and engineers revolved around borrowing tools. Today, what began as a relationship of proximity has evolved into a fruitful new synthesis, a relationship of equal partners with converging questions. In other words, the convergence of those questions is exactly why you cannot consider yourself educated, even in your limited domain, if you know only one thing. If you know one thing, you know almost nothing. Because, as she said, in leading labs around the country where these are already building fruit, students are collaborating on projects in engineering, physics, biomedical science, and other fields. We must encourage young people, she said, to pursue work at the convergence cultivate new kinds of academic organizations, and tune our funding mechanisms toward boundary-crossing work. Now go back to what General Hay uh, Hayden said the other day in the keynote, and it's exactly the same thing, that the emergent understanding of disciplines and domains uh, is so challenging to our fundamental way of structuring our knowledge that it shatters it. But as you know, somebody else said 2,000 years ago, you cannot put new wine in old wineskins. They crack and break. You cannot put new paradigms, new material into old paradigms. They crack and break. You must be cross-disciplinary. You must be exploring opportunities in things that influence and impact one another. And these disciplines do not have names. You know, I realized this first. My, one of my sons is 40 now. And when he was um, 18 or so, he went to Northwestern. He had to choose a major. And... Um, I remember when he graduated, uh, they said history majors and science majors and so on. And then they said, and we have one ad hoc major. And everybody laughed because it sounded so funny. Uh, but what it meant was that my son, of whom I am justly proud, had seen that he could not find in any one discipline the combination of things he needed to know to do what he wanted to do. He called it symbolic system studies. And he combined material from math and philosophy and cognitive science and artificial intelligence and computer science. And he went to each of the five departments and talked them into giving him credit for different pieces of each, each domain, which for academia is really breaking down silos, and creating a new major, in effect, an ad hoc major that had no name. And all I'm saying is those of us who have lived through that and keep going forward know that ad hoc majors is the name of adult learning. We cannot learn unless we learn in a cross-disciplinary way. And that means surf the waves of the different disciplines 
that influence one another, none of which we can master completely. Because now it has grown to a point where the information in any domain of expertise is unknowable in its entirety by any expert in that domain. You cannot know it all. And therefore you're forced back in what Jeff Moss said to me years ago, there's too much to know. So the most important thing I need to know is what I don't need to know, but I need to know who knows it so I can get it when I need it. In other words, the discipline of knowing how to live and work in networks, to be a node in a network, and therefore to exercise power in a different way. Jeff Moss was a kid who called 100 people out of cyberspace to Vegas for a meeting 18 years ago, and now there were 8,000 people here and there were 6,000 of Black Hat. I'm being reflective and kind of nostalgic because 15 years ago I did my first talk at DEF CON. The next year we talked at that convention about starting Black Hat. And the next year Black Hat started and it's grown into something entirely else. What I'm saying is the danger is that you accept what it has grown into and then this is who we have become and this is what we are. And as soon as you think that, you're, o you're old. You're old and you're gone. Because the cross-disciplinary emergence of new ways of thinking and literally new domains of expertise is constantly happening. And therefore, you have to constantly learn how to submit yourself to be a node in a network and not a control of the entire network. So how does all this go together? Well, let me see what time it is, 7.35. Okay. Um, you have to participate in this domain of understanding then the way hackers have learned to participate in a meritocracy by studying everything you can, learning everything you can, and then going to the collaboratory, the online collaboratory, which is now available everywhere always 24-7, and with respect and humility, taking your lack of knowledge to the experts in the domain. Pay attention to what they say, to how they act. Don't come on to them. But with humility, ask for help when you need it. And they know when you have done all the work you can and then are willing to extend the helping hand. Hackerdom has created this meritocracy and it has worked beautifully. Corporations cannot emulate it easily because it is voluntary and participatory and based on influence and a mutual recognition and respect. But it also means that when you work that way, your ego diminishes. And when your ego diminishes, something happens. You know who the big names in hacking are. You want to know a secret? You want to know why you know your name, their names? Because their vocation is to make their name known. That's why. The biggest names in hacking and computer science, you don't know their names. They're in the dark. You know, NSA has about, what, 80,000 people. You know, it's got more, more PhDs per dense mile than anywhere else. Uh, you don't know their names. The people who have done some of the best work in the world in this bifurcated post-World War II of ours, this world, uh, we don't know their names. And you learn as your ego diminishes and you participate in this network that the most important minds that have created this space have labels on them that you cannot read. Their vocation was to create the space and disappear into it. One of my favorite stories in mind games, which obviously I'm trying to sell, a uh, collection of 19 stories, uh, is Gibby the sit-down king. Gibby is, is a king hacker. Uh, all you see of Gibby is the view from the, from the back. You see his jeans way down on his ass and you see the little crack and you see the side of the chair and you see the multi-screened wall in front of which he sits. And why did he get in that position in the first place? Because he was an adolescent and he loved to masturbate. That's why. So he created every sexual scenario he could imagine. And he hit a crisis. I won't give away the whole story, but my favorite image of Gibby is sitting there with both arms bandaged from multiple stress, unable to lift one arm off the platform to which it has been tightly strapped because the carpal tunnel is just so painful. And that's when he really conceives of both teledidonics and simultaneously the creation of alter genies, which enable people to develop through biomods their own sexual fetishes and preferences, and then he distributes those kits to build your own alter genies and change yourself so that you will like what you choose to like instead of, as most people find, what they happen to like. Uh, and, and then he creates the scenarios through hacking which are available in multi-level ways. Well, yeah, I just love that story. Um, be, 
because what happens as he works his way up the ladder of symbol making is he begins to see more and more deeply the kinds of things I'm trying so hard with in vain to describe and he disappears into the very fabric of the mind he ultimately perceives himself to be making the symbols that enable others to make the symbols. So this links to the bigger theme of non-local consciousness and entanglement of particles. We know now that matter is merely dense energy and energy is merely diffused matter. Metaphorically, we could say that matter is energy that moves real slow and that uh, energy is matter that moves real fast. But there's fundamentally no difference between the two and that's why matter is entangled with matter. A particle with a particle. What is a particle? A particle is a possibility defined in a quantum way as a mathematical probability at a particular intersection of space-time. So when something is entangled with something else, of course remote viewing becomes a possibility. Of course it happens. Of course it can happen. I have had it happen to me. You have probably had moments of unconscious telepathy or clairvoyance yourselves. The trick is to know that you know that you have those experiences as possible and therefore open yourselves to some very weird shit. It just happened that a friend of mine was the head of an organization in Washington, D.C., who when I brought up remote viewing and what I was learning from talking to the remote viewers in the program, uh, he said, well, you know, we did the evaluation for CIA of the program, don't you? Uh, and of course I didn't, because you never know anything like that. And he said, do you want to see the report? Are you bowing down to me or showing me 10 minutes? Ten minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was flattering, but I thought a little over the top. <laughs> Okay, 10 minutes. Uh, so he said, do you want to see the report? And I said, of course, and he sent me the report. And what the report said is that, of course, yes, there is something very much to this. Read that interview with Joe McMonigle. There is something to it. It doesn't happen all the time. A guy named uh, Ken Kress did the program for the CIA. And why did they take it seriously? He said, we could find our attention, he, told, he said, to psychokinetics and remote viewing. That is to telekinesis to the influence of, quote, physical matter, which is energy, by human beings, which are physical matter, i.e. systems of energy, don't you start to see that when the boundaries dissolve, what you become possible to be is not who you thought you were. And when the subject, of whom he's discussing, placed his attention on the interior of a magnetometer, the output signal was visibly disturbed. There was a change in the internal magnetic field. The descriptions and then when they moved to uh, Pat Price, who began to do remote viewing for the CIA, his descriptions were so startlingly accurate that we suggested the work be continued and expanded. And after one of his remote viewing sessions, two analysts, a photo interpreter and a nuclear analyst from Los Alamos, agreed that his description of a particular site and what was there was so accurate that one, he actually saw it through remote viewing or he was informed what to draw by someone knowledgeable at URDF 3. Now when you read that interview with Joe McMonagall and you read that story of Gibby the sit-down king, you'll see that they both experienced something very similar, which is at the level of consciousness which we experience in deep states of meditation, the boundaries with which we describe our identities or the system you are hacking dissolve. You see that it is not that which you used as names, as labels, to approach it, but something utterly else. McMonagall and I agreed that when you reach that level of understanding and experience, language itself breaks. And in several of these stories that I wrote, the language itself breaks as a way to say that you cannot articulate what it is that you nevertheless deeply, truly understand and have the capacity to remember and know that you understand so that you can make it happen again. This sounds like some strange stuff. You know, it really isn't. It's just what's so. In the story in there called Silent Emergent Doubly Dark, I try to describe one of the deepest experiences I had, but it's done as metaphor. It was published as a slipstream story or a science fiction story. Uh, and it was about a person who goes into alien cultures in order to learn how alien cultures construct reality by immersing himself in them and then articulating how he has been changed by the process. But in fact, of course, each culture in which he immerses himself 
is a deeper state of consciousness. Much of the detail of the story came from my own 